John chapter 2, this is our second sermon on Christ's first miracle, water into wine. And we're going to read uh, John 2, 1 to 11. And uh, I'm spending quite a bit of time on this because it's such a fascinating passage and it's, it's so rich in doctrine and application. And uh, we'll just continue here. Starting at verse 1. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the governor of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have drunk well, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good until now. This beginning of miracles that Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Okay, we've come to the need for wine. Verse 3. We looked at introductory considerations and uh, some application. Now we're going to look at the need for wine. In verse 3, John notes that the people in charge of the feast <coughs> ran out of wine. Or li more literally, they, they, were, they were running out of wine. They were beginning to run out of wine. It then gives us Mary's reaction. She tells Jesus, they have no wine. Which in that context has the meaning Son, do something about this. As the Messiah, as God incarnate, you can reveal yourself in a great miracle on a great occasion. As God's bridegroom for the church or congregation of the Lord, use this wedding to manifest your nature and being. That's essentially what she's saying. She believed she was, that Jesus was the Christ. Well, there are a number of things to note about these verses. First, the text does not tell us why they ran out of wine. <clears throat> Most older commentators believe that this is evidence that the families in charge of the wedding festivities were poor and of humble circumstances. The Jewish wedding feasts were of several days duration in the first century and involved a considerable consumption of food and wine. In Judges 14, 10 to 18, we read that Samson's marriage feast lasted for seven days. With a large wedding party of such duration, one could easily run out of wine without a single person drinking too much wine. Wealthy people would not want to be embarrassed by uh, running short, and thus would purchase an abundance of wine. But poor people could only purchase what they could afford. The statement they ran of wine is better translated literally as the wine began to fail. The earth's participle in the genitive absolute is best regarded as ingressive, began to fail for you Greek students. <laughs> the decline of wine would be discovered before the last of it was used. Some scholars suggest that cheap, lesser quality wines were in such abundance in Palestine at this time that running out of wine was simply a mistake in planning on the part of those, probably women, in charge of planning the feast. We really don't know. Mary was likely close friends with the women in charge of the feast. The fact that she knows that the wine is about to run out indicates that she was probably a server at the wedding feast. Second, Mary's statement about the wine failing to Jesus indicates that she has faith that her son has the ability to work miracles. Okay, this is the only logical explanation of her turning to him for help. 
modernist commentators will say, well, she wanted them to go purchase some more and try to raise some money. That's just nonsense. Our Lord had come to the wedding possibly at a moment's notice. He and his disciples were not wealthy men who carried about a lot of gold or silver. If Mary, as modernists suppose, was not looking for a miraculous solution, she could have taken a collection at the party. She would not seek financial help from a few poor disciples. Now, I didn't include this here, but a lot of uh, some commentators talk about how running out of, of wine at a wedding feast would be a very embarrassing situation that uh, would <laughs> be very undesirable. It would bring shame on the family. We can safely assume that since the disciples left their fishing nets behind for long periods of time <coughs> to follow Christ, that they did not have a lot of disposable income. <coughs> Clearly, her inspired request, implied request was much more than an ordinary appeal for help. She wanted Jesus to use his power to create more wine. Do something, do some kind of miracle. Mary was certainly a woman of great faith. There's no question about it. She was in daily expectation that he would prove himself the Messiah by some mighty act. And it was under these feelings that she turned to him saying, they have no wine. It is as though she said, surely the time is coming for declaring thyself. Manifest your power as I have long expected you to do, by providing a supply of wine. Now Mary's implied request to our Lord is one of the papal church's chief proof, te proof texts for the thoroughly heretical and blasphemous doctrine that Mary has been given a special task by God for, of interceding in heaven on behalf of Christians on earth. This is one of their main proof texts. And the idea of the Roman church, if you read some of their more sentimental literature, is, well, you know, you, know, you might ask your dad. You might be kind of angry. Uh, you, know, you don't want to ask your dad. What do you do? You go to your mother. You go to your mother, and you try to get your mother to convince your dad. Well, you don't want to go to Jesus, they say. Well, you, you go to Mary. She's a mediatrix. She'll intercede on your behalf. <clears throat> They have decided that Mary has been given a special task by God of interceding in heaven on behalf of Christians on earth. That such a doctrine is wicked nonsense can be proved by the following observations. Number one, <clears throat> there's not a shred of evidence in the text that others came to Mary and asked her to go to Jesus. The asking was her idea. Number two, it does not logically follow that because the petitions of living saints on earth are heard that the requests of dead saints in heaven are effectual. I was witnessing door to door and I ran into a uh, very devout Eastern Orthodox person. And they said, look, man, you know, you, you have people, you could have a saint pray for you on earth. Why can't he pray for you while he's up in heaven? That was his argument. For one thing, there can be no communication between the living and the dead. Remember the, in the, the parable, the, the guy wanted to go back and talk to his sons to warn them to repent and believe in Christ so they wouldn't end up where he was? And he couldn't. Abraham said, no, there's a great gulf fix. You can't go back. And according to God's law, by the way, attempts to communicate with the dead are on par with sorcery, necromancy, and witchcraft and are death penalty offenses. You're not to try to commune with the dead, even dead saints. Number three, the idea that millions of Christians can pray to Mary and the saints every day and even simultaneously at church requires Mary and the saints to be omniscient, which is blasphemy and idolatry. How many Roman Catholics are there in the world? There's over a billion Roman Catholics. I know most of them are nominal. And, you know, I was raised a Roman Catholic, and we had the rosary, and you pray so many Hail Marys in the rosary. There's, I think Hail Marys, there's more Hail Marys than anything else in the rosary. So you've got hundreds and thousands, even millions of people praying to Mary at the same time. How in the world could she possibly hear these petitions or analyze them? And then number four, this is crucial. Jesus Christ is identified as the only mediator between God and men, 1 Timothy 2.5. 
this makes perfect sense logically and theologically for only Jesus is both fully God and truly man in one person. Only Jesus died on the cross as a sacrifice and atoning death for sin. He paid the penalty in full. Nobody else. He alone conquered Satan, sin, and death, and he alone sits at the right hand of God the Father. Being a man who, Hebrews 2.18, was tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Being God, he can perfectly hear all our petitions. And, Hebrews 7.25, he ever lives to make intercession for us. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for eternity, Christ has that ability. He is God. The Romish heresy declares, uh, excuse me, uh, detracts from the glory that is due to Christ alone for redemption and is more in common with the old pagan worship of the supposed gods than biblical Christianity. They turn Mary into the saints into gods. And they say that there are saints that have been so holy and so righteous that they have more than they need to go to heaven and they can give those super abundance of merits to you. That's nonsense. Mary was a sinner who was saved by Christ. And she was only a virgin until after Jesus was born and then she had other children. The Bible's quite clear. Third, Jesus' answer to his mother is respectful yet corrective. Okay, I disagree with Calvin. He calls it a sharp rebuke. I do not think it's a sharp rebuke at all. Verse 4, Woman, what does your concern, this is the New King James, which I, I think is a little more accurate than the King James. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now this is a verse which has engendered a wide variety of interpretations and much speculation. Therefore, we must proceed with caution. The expression woman is in address to a mother in the first century, in first century Palestine, does not imply any disrespect whatsoever. Okay, we can't read, it would be very odd for an American to say to their mother, woman. Uh, and, you know, it's somewhat unusual uh, even back then, but it was not considered uh, disrespectful at all. One could translate the word as lady, a term of respect and dignity. And keep in mind, as a sinless man, Jesus could never show any disrespect toward his mother. Ever. At all. Period. While it is an unusual mode of address, one can find extra biblical literature where it is used in an affectionate manner. And I'm not going to quote from it from jo Josephus Antiquities, 1774. It certainly does not imply a rebuke in John 19, 26, where Jesus says to Mary, Woman... Behold your son. And of course, she's standing next to the Apostle John. Uh, Christ, being the firstborn son, had the moral obligation, according to the law of God, to take care of his mother, who was a widow. Him, being in the process of dying, turns that matter over to John. When our Lord said, woman, he did not indulge in rudeness. On the contrary, it was a very kind of him to emphasize by the use of this word that Mary must no longer think of him as being merely her son. For the more she conceives of him as her son, the more she will suffer when he, when he suffers. Mary must begin to look upon Jesus as her Lord. He's entered a new phase of his life. He's entered upon his ministry. It's time to start referring to me as Lord or Christ, or, but not son in that sense. Mary must be intimately aware that now that the Redeemer's public ministry has begun, she must relate to him as the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Roman Catholic Church and the deluded evangelicals who make these movies about Jesus, which themselves are unbiblical, <coughs> greatly err when they emphasize Mary's motherly role after Christ's ministry began. Even the movies put out by... Now, I'm not talking about the old movies from the 50s and the 60s, which actually stick to the text better than these modern movies. But they give Mary a role that goes way beyond 
Once Christ enters on his ministry, she fades into the background. We see her at the cross. We see her in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. But her role fades. They fail to recognize that in his ministerial role and in his divine messianic function, Jesus acknowledged no earthly relations, mother, brothers, or sisters, save the believing. Matthew 12, 46 to 50. Remember, Jesus is in a house and he's teaching, and his mother and brother are outside, and they want to talk to him. Then he goes into this dissertation. Who is my brother? Who is my mother? Who are my brethren? Those who follow, those who believe. While Mary was exceptionally blessed among women, because she was given the role of Jesus' earthly mother, she plays no significant role in the Gospels or Acts once our Lord's ministry begins. She is a Christian among Christians. That's it. She has a privileged place in biblical history, but is not a church leader and must never be worshipped. I like what Pink says here. To have addressed her as mother would have called attention to human relationships. But calling her woman showed that God was speaking to her. We may add that it is significant that the two times Christ addressed his mother as woman are both recorded in the Gospel of John, which sets forth his deity. Again, the employment of this term woman denotes Christ's omniscience. With prophetic foresight, he anticipated the horrible idolatry which was to ascribe divine honors to her. He knew that in the centuries that were to follow, men would entitle her the queen of angels and the mother of God. Hence, he refused to use a term which in any sense would countenance the monstrous system of Mariolatry. Christ would here teach us that Mary was only a woman, blessed among women, but not blessed over women. End of quote. I love that. Now, as we read the narrative, it is clear that Mary did not view Jesus' answer as a sharp rebuke. It is a rebuke. It is a gentle rebuke, but it's not a sharp rebuke. She came to realize that things between her and her son could not be the same as though they had been previously. The fact that she commanded the servant to obey Christ's instructions indicates that she believed that Jesus understood the present difficulty and would take action to relieve the situation. Now, our Lord's question to the King James, what have I to do with thee, in Greek reads, literally, what to me and you? What to me and you? The sense, I think, is better rendered by the New King James. What does your circumstance, or what does your concern have to do with me? The basic idea expressed here is that Mary is involving Jesus in an area which he reserves exclusively to himself. And this phrase, by the way, is used many times in the Greek Septuagint. Tiamoi, Kai, Soi, I'm not sure how, S-O-I, is a phrase translated from the Hebrew occurring several times in the Greek Bible and always is suggestive of a diversity of opinion or interest. Thus in Judges 11 verse 12, Jephthah says, Tiamoi, Kai, Soi, that's in the Septuagint, in hostile challenge to the king of the Ammonites. David, 2 Samuel 16, 10 says, Tiamoi, Kai, uh, Umid, what's that between me and you? To the sons of Jeriah, meaning he does not agree with their advice. The women of Sarepta, 1 Kings 17, 11, reproaches Elijah with the same phrase. Elisha uses it in declining to help King Jehoram, 2 Kings 3, 13. Necro, king of Egypt, says that Josiah, Tiamoi Kai Soi, the exact same phrase, meaning, why should we fight? I am not marching against you, 2 Chronicles 35, 21. And in Mark 5, 7, the man with the unclean spirit says the same thing to Jesus. What do you concern yourself? Why do you concern yourself with me? Let me alone. Mark 1, 24 and Matthew 8, 29. See, the phrase does not always imply reproach, but it's, it's suggested. Here it seems to be a gentle suggestion of misunderstanding. I shall see to that. It would be better, it will be better if you leave that to me. 
In other words, I know when I'm supposed to perform a miracle. Don't be telling me what to do, but saying it in a very gentle way. This idea comes through with Jesus' explanation, my hour has not yet come. Normally, the term hour in reference to Christ in this gospel denotes his death on the cross and resurrection. 7.30, 8.20, 13.1 to 17.1. In this context, such an interpretation does not make sense for it's over three years off in the future. So the term hour refers to a certain stage or time of his ministry. Jesus' hour is the one appointed for him by the Father. It may be the hour for this or the hour for that in his messianic work. When it comes, he acts, and not until it comes. I'm sovereign over my ministry. I'm doing the Father's will. God tells me, God the Father tells me when to work a miracle. So Jesus here never hurries, nor lets others hurry him. He waits for his hour, and then he meets it. Here the hour is the one arrayed for the first miraculous manifestation of his glory. In performing this miracle, he will not be importuned or pushed into something, even by his own mother. So it's a very gentle, loving rebuke. And then that brings us to the, the, the first miracle of Christ, the great miracle. And we're just going to get started, and then we'll have to continue this. <clears throat> With the need of wine known, and our Lord's gentle corrective teaching to his mother made, the time for action has come, verse 5. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Once again, Mary's faith is remarkable. She had a remarkable faith. She did not misunderstand the Savior's correction, she knew that Jesus is aware of all the facts and has a complete trust in his decision and ability to work a miracle. Her command is totally unlimited. Everything is left in the hands of Christ. Mary reserves full liberty of action to her son and thus enters in again within her own bounds. Yes, Jesus, you're right. You're God. You're sovereign. You're the Christ. I'm leaving it in your hands. Which earlier she had overstepped. Other women may have required more, but not Mary. She knew her son and had complete faith in his divine power. In the Greek, the command to obey Christ is an aorist imperative, which in John's gospel is a very strong authoritative command. Do it! Remember that all of this occurred before Jesus had done any miracles. He had not done any miracles yet. Clearly, Mary and the disciples were in a state of great expectation. Now think about this. Can it be imagined for a moment for, that the disciples had not related everything which had just occurred in Judea, the solemn declarations of John the Baptist, the miraculous scene of the baptism proclaimed by John, the proof of supernatural knowledge which Jesus had given on meeting Nathaniel, finally that magnificent promise of greater things impending, they're, they're about to come, of an open heaven, of angels ascending and descending, which their eyes were going to henceforth to behold, they were in incredible expectation of Jesus showing forth his power. Now, some find Mary's immediate response to Jesus' corrective words is somewhat baffling. If this public manifestation as the Messiah through signs had not yet come, why does she turn around and act as though it has come? Well, in response to this apparent problem, it's not really a problem, there are two uh, plausible answers. One is that there must be something about Jesus' tone and expression that caused Mary to believe some kind of answer to the need was forthcoming. In addition, and this is the crucial point, which we've already mentioned, the fact that Mary placed her full confidence in Christ and gave him the full liberty to do whatever he wanted indicates that uh, 
She was no longer overstepping her bounds, which she had overstepped earlier. Lord, I trust you. I know that you're going to do the right thing. You're going to do what you want to do. It's going to be the right thing. I fully trust you. It is noteworthy that she commands the servants to do whatever Jesus tells them to do. She expects Christ to tell the servants to do something that they may not, that may not make any sense to them whatsoever. No matter how extraordinary or strange the Lord's instructions are, they must be followed to the jot and tittle. And you, there, there's other things like this in the Gospels where a man is blind and he's told to put muddy goo in his eyes. And we'll get into this, Lord willing, next week where we talk about he's using, he uses means to work an uh, amazing miracle. And the means show forth faith. You know, putting mud in your eye, that's ridiculous. If anything, you think it might make you blind. You might get an eye infection. But it shows that you have faith in Christ. Or go wash, go wash in the Jordans seven times or whatever. These things show you have faith. You're trusting in his word. There are a few applications from this verse that merit our, uh, our attention. Number one. We should strive to have the faith that Mary had. She had a complete trust in Christ, and she never doubted for a moment his person or his work. She knew that whatever he did would be the wisest, most correct, and best course of action, and placed her complete trust in him. We have to emulate that faith. That's the kind of faith we want to have. There are going to be times when people do not understand something in the Bible and may even disagree with certain things. Do you mean I can't get an Easter bunny and have eggs and have egg hunts and celebrate Easter, celebrate Ashtart? Do you mean I can't celebrate Christmas and get a tree and have Santa? There's things in the Bible that that the Bible teaches that people may not like and may not understand as yet. But you have to have faith and you have to trust that these things are right and they're the best for you. If that is the case with any of us, then we must acknowledge that we are wrong and the Bible is right and submit to it wholeheartedly we don't follow our feelings, we follow the word of God. And Jay Adams is excellent on this. He talks about, look, there's going to be things that you don't want to do. There are going to be areas that you may not want to do, your feelings. You don't feel like getting up in the morning. You don't, sometimes you don't feel like being nice to your wife. Sometimes you don't feel like obeying your parents. And he says, you don't go by your feelings. You submit to the word of God. And if you keep submitting to the word of God, your feelings will get in line with the word of God. We must acknowledge that we are wrong and the Bible is right and submit to it wholeheartedly. The Lord will straighten out our ignorance in due time. But in the meantime, we must joyfully obey the word of God, whether we understand it or not. And then number two, we should seek to have the humility of Mary. She was greatly, excuse me, she was gently rebuked by her son, yet submitted to the rebuke immediately. She took no offense. When we are chastened by the Lord for immorality or error in doctrine or practice, our best course of action is to accept the rebuke with humility and repent at once. There's nothing worse than making excuses and refusing to repent. And then number three. This verse tells us that we must submit to Christ in all things. His commands and teachings must be obeyed without equivocation, without delay, without excuse making, or rational inquiry. 
The fact that Jesus has said it must suffice. It must be enough. Our Lord has spoken, and that settles the matter. That has to be your position of faith. Christ cannot be wrong. He's God. We cannot be wiser than Christ. He is God, and he's a perfect man. He's a sinless man. He's the most godly man who ever lived. He never sinned. This kind of unqualified, absolute obedience only applies to one person, and that's Christ. Nobody else in history. If you read the oaths to Stalin, you read the oaths to Adolf Hitler, they're shockingly satanic. Only Christ receives an unqualified promise of obedience. All others are to be obeyed, to be obeyed only in the Lord, only as they obey Scripture and teach the same thing as Scripture. If they contradict the Word of God, they must be challenged and we must obey God rather than man. There is a sense in which our faith is gauged by our obedience to Christ. When a person refuses to obey, what they know to be a biblical teaching. They are implicitly saying to themselves that they know better than God. <clears throat> that they believe that human autonomy will bring more blessing than obedience to God's infallible word. And that shows a complete lack of faith. When Eve sinned in the garden, and listened to the devil, what did she do? Well, she looked at the fruit. She analyzed it empirically. She was, the, in a sense, the first scientist. Of course, Adam had already been naming animals. But she looked at the fruit. She, she analyzed it. It's pleasing to the sight. It's a beautiful piece of fruit. It's juicy and tender. It's great looking. And what did she do? She analyzed it autonomously, and she said to herself, it can't be wrong. It can't be wrong to eat this fruit. My senses tell me it's okay. And so she acted autonomously, thinking she would receive a blessing. And Satan lied to her and promised her a blessing. God's trying to pull one over on you. He knows that the day you eat that fruit, you're going to be like him. Determining for yourself what is good and what is evil. You're going to receive great blessings by not submitting to God, but rather submitting to your own autonomous human will. So whenever we disobey what the Bible teaches... We're showing a lack of faith. We're put, placing our faith in autonomous human reason and empiricism instead of the word of God. Such thinking by churchmen turned the pure apostolic church into the satanic beast of Roman Catholicism, the Church of Antichrist. Christmas seems, it just, I, you know, I use this as an example because everybody loves Christmas and very few people think it's wrong. Christmas seems so innocent. Kids love it. It's a great family day. It's a wonderful thing. What harm could it do? Well, extra biblical holy days have destroyed Sabbatarianism in our culture and society and such human additions to the word of God have led to the medieval Roman Catholic Church, which is totally satanic God understands the long run God understands what is best for you you have to trust him and not yourself in verse 6 John adds an editorial comment that his readers especially Gentiles will un uh, so his readers especially Gentiles will understand the circumstances of the miracle now, there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Now, that's a New King James, and I do not like what they did there. They, they paraphrased, and they added, they told us what it, what it is. They should have just put the Greek word in there uh, and, and let it had a side note telling us how many gallons it was. The Jews in the days of Christ... <clears throat> had peculiar religious customs regarding ceremonial washings. They would purify their hands before they ate. They would purify their 
cups and their dishes and their saucers and even their couches with water, ritually. It was a religious ceremony. They, they added that to the law of God. They would purify their hands and all sorts of things because they believed that these ceremonial washings were necessary for holiness. In Mark 7, 3 to 4, we learn that such practices were pharisaical traditions. They're not required by the word of God. They were added to the word of God. Here's what it says. For the Pharisees, this isn't the thing where they, they complain to Jesus and the Jews about them not washing their hands before they eat. And that means ritually. They weren't doctors, you know, saying, hey, you might get bacteria. It was a ritual washing. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received in whole, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Such frequent washings require a large amount of water to be on hand in the household, for the Jews did not have plumbing, and it would be impractical to run to the well every time you wanted to wash a pot or your hands. And Muslims still do this sort of thing. The, the terrorists of 9-11, they all ritually wash themselves before they, before they uh, descended into the pit of hell after murdering a bunch of innocent people. They had ritual washings similar to this. <clears throat> so what they did is they would go to their well and they'd fill up all these big, huge water pots with water, keep them on hand. Now these stone jars were not carved out of rock but are a certain type of very strong, thick pottery. There's different kinds of pottery. There's pottery made out of clay and there's pottery made out of other substances. These were giant water pots. And the Jews preferred this type of material because they believed it could not become unclean. Such jars, by the way, are still used in areas of Syria today. Each jar is said to hold two or three firkins apiece. A firkin, some translations, a bath. The Greek here is metretes, where we get the word meter. And I think it should be translated a measure. It was the equivalent of about eight and a half gallons. <clears throat> Therefore, these huge jars held between 17 to 25 gallons apiece. But think about that. You know what a five-gallon bucket, how big a five-gallon bucket is. Well, imagine having three five-gallon buckets put together. They were humongous. This tells us that the six storage jars held a total capacity of between 100 to 150 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. Now, temperance advocates and legalistic evangelicals, and there's legalistic reform people as well, argue that such a great quantity proves that Jesus must have made grape juice or wine without any alcohol in it. Otherwise, people would have had so much wine, they would have gotten drunk. I mean, imagine having 100 gallons of wine at a party, 150 gallons of wine, really good wine. <clears throat> Such a biblical ignorant thinking does not take into account the great size of Jewish wedding feasts. Whole extended families with many relatives and friends would have been invited. The anti-alcohol advocates act as though the Jews were stupid and would not be able to drink in moderation. The, this anti-alcoholic fervor that came from the 1900s, the 1800s and continues with it's, it's dying out to a degree. Uh, it's almost like behavioralism or something. It's almost like materialism that people, do, you know, if, if, the, if the thing is there, you're not going to be able to restrain yourself. You're just going to grab wine and start getting drunk immediately or something. It's just, it's just absurd. Moreover, a feast would last several days and would need an exceptionally large quantity of wine. In verse 7, Jesus takes action. He said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they fill them to the brim. This verse emphasizes that the water pots contain nothing but water. They were filled to the very brim. There was no trickery involved, for nothing could have been added to the pots. 
Nobody could say, well, he had a mixture and he mixed it in or something. It's proof of the miracle, which is being set forth here. And sorry about this, but the application is going to wait till next week. Uh, we'll, we'll finish the miracle next week, Lord willing, and uh, we'll have the application. There's a lot going on here that is pretty unique. The fact that Christ takes water pots, which are symbols of a dead Judaism, of human traditions, of ritual purification, of a system that has failed, and he creates wine, which is like a symbol of the new covenant. There's a lot of symbolism here. We're going to look at that next week. And it's just important. Uh, and this is the thing about John's gospel. John, John's the one who really likes to do this. He, he tells these simple little stories, but if you look at them carefully, there's a lot of beef there. There's a lot of meaning there. There's a lot of things there that if you're not paying attention, you will not see these things. And we're going to draw these things out in detail, Lord willing, next week. Let us pray. Father, we just give you thanks for this incredible story. Thank you for telling us about the faith of Mary so that we would have a biblical proper view of this wonderful Christian woman and not the pagan idolatrous view of Roman Catholicism and of much of Christendom, which is apostate and wicked. We ask, Lord, that we could have this kind of faith that just obeys Christ without questioning anything he says, that we would have complete and full trust in him, that when our interests contradict his interests, that you would cause our hearts to bend and bow before him and that we would set our interest on the back burner and serve him faithfully and fully, trusting and knowing that he has only the best in mind for us and that if we want to be blessed, if we want covenant blessings, we must obey the Son of God, the Christ. So bend our hearts, Lord, that we would obey your dear Son in Jesus' name. Amen.